worship for Sunday, August the 22nd, 2021. In today's gospel reading, many people take offense at Jesus' invitation to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Even many of Jesus' disciples peel off. This is the backdrop in John's gospel for Peter's confession of faith. To whom can we go? asks Peter, in words we sometimes sing just before the gospel is read. You have the words of eternal life. In order to take such a stand as Peter did, Paul tells us to arm ourselves with the word of God. We pray in the spirit that we might be bold ambassadors of the gospel, witnesses to God's great love. The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weaver from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us for worship today. A special welcome again today to the people of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Conestogo, just outside of Waterloo. They will be worshiping with us virtually while their pastor, Joanna, is on vacation. Thank you to our Minister of Music, Katrina Lowe, and her mother, Karen Peters, for playing and recording a prelude and postlude for us today. In these challenging and unforeseeable times, if you find that you need someone to talk to, or if you need any assistance, please email me or phone me at the church office and I will help you. Members of St. Matthew's Conestogo are encouraged to contact their interim pastor, Jeff Smith. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to be together in whatever way possible in this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth, that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The children's time, Solomon builds the temple. I am so very glad that you're here today, and I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. I can't wait until we can once again meet together. Today, I want you to think about the last time you were in a church building. Can you remember what it was made of? Maybe stone or bricks or wood? Was that church building smaller or bigger than your home? And would you say that the church building was fancy or was it plain? We are Christians, followers of Jesus, and we often construct church buildings so that we have a special place to worship God. Jesus was Jewish, and many years ago, the Jewish people built a temple, that's a church for Jewish people, so that they would have a special place to worship God. Let's watch a video about the first temple, which was built by King Solomon for God. Hey kids, have you ever thought about what God's house looks like? Like maybe he lives in a house with a big backyard, or maybe has a full-size movie theater in the basement. Well, in today's lesson, we're gonna learn while God lived in the Old Testament. David's job was to fight wars. Solomon's job was to build a temple. Do you remember King David from our last lesson? Well, he wanted to build a temple for God. But God didn't want David to build it because he fought too many wars. So he told them that his son Solomon would build it instead. So when Solomon became king, there was peace throughout all the land. And he was able to get to work on a temple for God. Solomon's temple was big and beautiful. It was like the most beautiful building you have ever seen. Close your eyes and imagine it with us. It was a huge building made out of beautiful wood and huge stones. All of the ends had really cool carvings and covered with gold. And they had a special room with a big golden altar in it. But that's not even the coolest part. Solomon's temple is where God's presence lived. That special room had something called the Ark of the Covenant in it. It was a really pretty and really special gold box. And inside of it, it had the Ten Commandments, 
that God gave to Moses. And when they placed it inside of the room, a big cloud surrounded the temple. And God's presence filled the temple. And so God's presence lived in the temple. Well, kind of. We know that God's so big and powerful, He's everywhere at once. So not all of Him lived in the temple. But the temple was a special place where God's presence was extra powerful. And that's where God's people went to worship Him. So why don't we go to temples to worship God now? We don't need temples anymore, because God lives in His people. You see, Solomon's temple was just a building, and eventually, it was destroyed. But hundreds of years later, something really cool happened. Jesus was born, and then He died on the cross, and then He rose again. And when we follow Him, He gives us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit lives in our hearts and helps us honor God and make good decisions. So that's why we don't need temples anymore. Memory verse. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. God lives in a really cool house, but it's not one with the playground or movie theater. It's you. Hey kids and parents, if you want to learn more about wise King Solomon, or God, check out the links below. So, we are God's house, God's temple. And that means God is wherever we are. God is always with us. And that's very good news. Now I invite you to move into your favorite prayer posture. It may be hands open, facing up to receive the gift of God's presence in prayer. It may be hands folded and eyes closed to help you concentrate. Or it may be crossing your arms across your chest to form an X, the first letter of Christ in Greek, and it feels like a hug from God. Now let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for living with us and making us your temple. Help us to feel your presence with us and move us to share your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Your parents have children's bulletins for you that you're welcome to work on at any time, even while you're listening to the sermon. Solomon's Prayer at the Temple Dedication Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem and put the Ark of the Covenant there. This passage includes part of the prayer Solomon prays at the dedication of the temple. He prays for the fulfillment of God's promises to David and for God to hear the prayers of all the faithful. A reading from 1 Kings. Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place, in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart, the covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him. You promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you said, My name shall be there. 
that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place, heed and forgive. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays towards this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they might know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Bread of Eternal Life The hard saying that offends Jesus' disciples is his claim that his followers must eat his flesh and drink his blood. The followers who return to their old lives know something about how odd this sounds. Simon Peter, on the other hand, knows something about the scarcity of living gracious words. He asks the most important question, to whom shall we go? The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, the flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And Jesus said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The Sermon. God is present and available. I'd like you to think for a moment about when and where it is that you have felt close to God? What was the setting? What was the circumstance? I'd be glad for you to share in the comments section on YouTube about those special times. I feel close to God in the mystical and magical time of Christmas Eve after the late worship service. That Christmas Eve sense of the closeness of God began for me here at St. Paul's when I was a child. Did we always go to Don and Audrey's home after midnight worship every year? Did it always snow lightly in the darkness as we moved from church to their home? In my memory, that's how it was. Christmas Eve after worship while leaving for church, I've always felt a deep sense of peace, gratitude and contentment. Christmas Eve after worship remains a special time that I feel close to God, even to this very day. In today's first appointed reading, King Solomon is dedicating to God the temple that Solomon has just built. Now up until this time in the history of God's people, they had no temple. Up until this time in the history of God's people, the central symbol of God's presence had been the Ark of the Covenant, a fancy portable box built to hold the two stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments had been inscribed. 
Later, a sample of the manna God had provided for food was also added to the ark, as was Aaron's rod. But by the time of Solomon's temple was built, those last two items had been lost, and only the two stone tablets remained. When Moses wanted to hear from God, the Ark of the Covenant served as a meeting place where Moses and God would come together. The Ark of the Covenant was the place that Moses felt close to God. Here's a reconstruction of what the Ark of the Covenant might have looked like. The Ark of the Covenant was about four feet, or a bit more than a meter, long, and about two feet, or a bit less than a meter, in width and depth. It was gilded inside and out with gold. Those poles attached to it were so that the Ark could be carried by priests or Levites as the people journeyed for 40 years in the wilderness. But now that they've arrived in the Promised Land, they are trading the portable Ark for a more majestic and enduring temple as the visible symbol of the presence of God, as the place they could feel close to God. In today's first appointed reading, the Ark of the Covenant is placed in the newly completed temple. In King Solomon's dedication prayer for the temple, he recognizes that as majestic and as awe-inspiring as the temple is, as Solomon says, even heaven and highest heaven cannot contain God, much less this house that I've built. For God cannot be contained to a building. God is as present to us in the Ark of the Covenant, the temple, or in the church, as God is present in every moment of our lives. When is it that you feel closest to God? God is available to us wherever we are. Nikki Hardiman, a Baptist minister in Georgia, tells an interesting story about just how present God is, no matter who we are. I have a friend who grew up in a a household that caused a lot of pain for her. It was very abusive, very scary, but she has a very real memory of being five years old and hiding. And Jesus came to her. She didn't know who Jesus was, but she felt Jesus's presence and Jesus made her feel safe. Hmm. And then years later, she was able to go to the church and who she saw on the wall is who came to her. Wow. And, you know, it, it's one of those fantastical stories that, that seems like it can't be real, but I listened to my friend tell it and I believe every bit of it. Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain God, much less this house that I have built, says Solomon. God is present in every moment of our lives, whether we go to church or not, whether we know God or not. And then in today's gospel reading, Jesus tells about a new way that God would come to us, in Jesus' body and blood, the bread and wine of Holy Communion. But we're told that many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. You see, God is available to us and comes to us and then God calls us to serve, to die to self, and to live for others, for the foreigner that King Solomon prayed about when dedicating the temple. Solomon prayed when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes and prays toward this house, then hear and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name. In Old Testament times, the great patriarch Abraham was blessed so that he could be a blessing to others. King Solomon knew that and so dedicated the temple for the sake of the foreigner. And Jesus continues that track in calling us to serve others. The temple, the church exist for the sake of those who are foreigners, for the sake of outsiders. And we continue in that track of serving others our guiding principles state in part that we will reach out in caring kindness to the needs of others. Often, that service to others will come at a cost. At age 13, for example, Nobel laureate, laureate Malala Yousafzai began blogging about conditions in schools 
in the Swat Valley under the Taliban, advocating for opportunities for girls. Two years later, she was targeted by a gunman. Today, as a student at Oxford, she continues her commitment to the goal that all girls receive 12 years of free, safe, quality education. No matter what one's religion, following shalom and human dignity as proclaimed by Jesus will be met with resistance and often violence. And that's the reason people stop following Jesus. Can you hear the tenderness, the almost pleading quality of Jesus' voice when at the end of today's gospel reading, Jesus asks the 12, do you also wish to go away? And can you see Jesus' face brightened at Peter's response? Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, we have to be careful not to misunderstand what the gospel writer John means by eternal life. Our tendency in the past had been to think that eternal life means heaven. But for John, the gospel writer, eternal life is life lived now in the knowledge that God is present. And one of the ways that God helps foster that knowledge and relationship is in Holy Communion, as we receive Jesus, the bread of life, so that we do not die spiritually. We look forward to that time when we can again gather around the Lord's table. For our opening devotions at our council meeting this past week, I chose the final words from Matthew's Gospel. And Jesus said to his disciples, remember, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. That's good news. Jesus is present and available to us always. And then at the end of our council devotions, I asked our council to keep in mind a question as we move into whatever the new normal will become for the church. The question is this, how will we at St. Paul share in word and deed the good news of God's great love. God is available and present to us in the temple, at church, and throughout our lives. And God calls us to let others in on that secret. May it be so among us. Amen.
made children and heirs of God's promise. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need, saying, Lord, in your love, and responding, hear our prayer. God of courage, bless all leaders of your church. Make them ready in these challenging times to proclaim the gospel of peace and strengthen them to preach your loving word. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of creation, bless fields and orchards. Instruct your people in wise treatment of the world you have provided for all your creatures. Send relief to those suffering from wildfires, drought, flooding, and earthquakes. Help us to act decisively to limit further catastrophe due to the global climate crisis and move us to assist the poor seriously affected. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of community, bless the work of all who seek justice between nations and peoples. Give guidance to bridge builders, heal divisions, and inspire. We pray especially for the people of Afghanistan. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of compassion, bless all who are in any need. Accompany all who are lonely and feeling abandoned and remind them of your abiding presence. Accompany all who are persecuted and exploited and open us to their cries. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of change, bless our transitions. Guide all who are embarking on new stages in life, such as a new job, new school, or new community. Sustain them with enduring friendships and kindle new relationships and interests. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of community, you work for the safety of all. Overhaul all those factors which have led to rampant gun violence in our region. Grant solace to first responders who witness this evil firsthand. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of the outsider, you care for all people. As our municipal government considers the location of a new consumption and treatment site for Cambridge, create timely and caring decisions that foster the common good, save lives, and recognize your love for each and every one of us. Bless the work of all who help in providing vaccinations. Keep our frontline workers safe and give them much needed rest. Move us each to do our part in following the guidance of our public health authorities so that our health system does not become overwhelmed. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of comfort, bless all who mourn the deaths of their beloved ones. We give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us. Renew our confidence in your promise of resurrection and life in the world to come. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace. Receive the blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen.
go in peace. You are the body of Christ, God's temple. Thanks be to God.